Hello, everybody. Hello, students of Penn State University. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, so my name is William McGrath, and I am a professor at Manhattan College, um, where I'm in the Religious Studies Department, and I specialize in Tibetan and Chinese um, religions and medicines also, and kind of and explore those from historical perspectives. Um, so today we'll be talking about Tibetan Buddhism and contagious disease uh, from fear to care. And um, the general context of this, of course, is the novel coronavirus, which uh, has impacted so many of our lives these days, um, which is why I'm giving this lecture from the comfort of my own home. It's April 8th. Um, we've closed our school at Manhattan College for about a month now. Um, and so we will finish the semester with online teaching as well, just like many other universities around the world. Um, and so on this first slide, I'd like to draw your attention to an image of Yuto Yundinbumbo. Um, he is actually not going to be a major player in today's presentation, but he's uh, utterly important for Tibetan medicine. Um, he, we could say he's the Hippocrates of Tibet, uh, the Tibetan medical uh, scripture, the Four Tantras, is attributed to him, or at the very least to his editing and his transmission. So he's seen as a father of Tibetan medical traditions. He's, a, he's an extremely important figure in the early transmission of medicine in Tibet. You can see he's holding a vase in his left or right hand. Um, this we could interpret as a vase of ambrosia, which is actually a term we'll see uh, later on in the presentation. In his other hand, he's holding a, a medicinal plant with fruits and flowers and leaves, um, and we, we can probably identify as Mirabalin. Um, and so here's a really uh, a, a classic image of Yudo Yudungumbo. I uh, used it, I, I borrowed it, let's say, from the Himalayan Art Resource website, which uh, I, I highly encourage you to check out. And as we go through the presentation, many other images also uh, come from, from HAR, as you'll see. So here we have Yudo Yudin Gumbo. Um, and here we have Yudo wearing a mask. Uh, as you can probably guess, this was edited relatively recently. Um, I, I found the Weibo user, Sui Ho the Gu Dian Ren. Um, so the last classical man, if we translate uh, his, his name literally. Um, so I'm not sure who that is, but he, he appears to have uh, added this mask and of course, we all can understand why, right? Even if he were in America now, the CDC would recommend that he wears a mask, which uh, was a bit of a controversial topic, but I think we finally kind of come through on, on the right side of history. It took a little time. Uh, and so why am I showing you this picture? Uh, well, this image is at the beginning of a poem that I translated for High Peaks Pure Earth um, two months ago. So this has been on the internet for a very long time. And as you can see from this very brief uh, timeline that I'm giving you here and in the next slide, uh, this pandemic has been going for uh, a very long time. The WHO recognized the novel coronavirus as a pandemic uh, approximately one month ago. Um, but it was a global, it was known to be a global health emergency as early as January. Right, it was first uh, reported to the WHO a month before that. So um, it's really come in stages, and with each passing month, it seems we're we're entering into a new phase of this virus. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, as of today, there are almost uh, 1.5 million confirmed cases worldwide, which is a really it's a staggering number. Um, the number of deaths, 83. Thousand more, more than eighty-three thousand um, in the United States. More than four hundred thousand cases. Again, allow that to sink in. More than four hundred thousand cases in the United States. Um, Twelve thousand eight hundred deaths, which of course is rising and, and rose significantly in just the past day. There have been thousands of deaths every day. Um, I, I think the the Surgeon General said this is this week will be our Pearl Harbor 
Um, he said that after rolling back his comments about masks again. Um, and if we compare this with China, um, 81,800 confirmed cases. And that's been relatively flat for, um, well, a month and a half now. So, um, and 3,300 reporting reported deaths, which is also, statistically speaking, relatively low, which um, has raised all sorts of speculations about reported numbers, uh, confirmed cases, are, does this really reflect the situation on the ground? I think most people agree that not everybody who has the disease has been tested. And so there are, these numbers are almost certainly low, which is why I keep them round and with a plus sign at the end. Um, and the language of confirmed is important too, right? R reported deaths versus actual deaths. I don't think we will ever know how many cases uh, are really out there in the world today. It could be a, just a, an unimaginable number. Um, Okay, so again, here's the timeline. Uh, December, we get the first cases in Wuhan. Um, again, there, there's been, in the media, um, if you've been following along, there's been quite a bit of conversation about these first cases um, since January. Um, China ref reported, officially reported, the first cases of this unknown virus to the WHO shortly after. Uh, they were able to determine the genetic code for the coronavirus. Um, we had our first death in January, the first uh, COVID-19 death. That, using that term is a little bit of an anachronism. I don't think it had the term COVID-19 associated with it yet until February, but um, you know we can we can look back and um, retrospectively diagnose what was happening. Uh, Wuhan, which was of course the center of the disease. Uh, entered into quarantine on the 23rd. And that's a really important date, right? That's when things started to change very quickly in China. Um, and then that same quarantine just ended today. So I felt like I had to mention that to you. Um, so Wuhan has been locked down, to put it kind of colloquially, for just over two months. And um, things are finally, we could say, going back to normal. I wouldn't say that they are back to normal yet, but they're perhaps on their way. And um, again, to put this in perspective, China's curve uh, began to flatten around 80,000 cases in late February. So uh, before United States even had, um, I, I, I had more than just a few hundred cases, uh, the curve already began to flatten in China. And of course, March is where things just really went out of control in the United States. Um, this is not a presentation about the United States, so I encourage you to read uh, the news and, and compare this timeline with what's been happening here. But just because um, we are all in it, we all understand that uh, there's something going on with this coronavirus, and I'd like to bring your attention to what has been happening in China and in Tibet most specifically. Um, so again, our, our main um, interlocutor today is Dr. Tuntun Punsuk. He, he's the uh, professor emeritus of Tibetan studies. He retired uh, somewhat recently. He used to teach in Beijing at the Central Minzu University, the Zhongyang Minzu Dashe, and then he moved to Chengdu and has been teaching at the Southwest Minzu University, um, the Sina Minzu Dashe. Um, and so again, if we look at when he starts writing, uh, and th this is all information that I pulled from his social media account, his WeChat account, and translated for High Peaks Pure Earth. I made a kind of a shout out to them in the corner there. If you want to read um, my written piece on all of this, you're welcome to go see that. But if we, if we look at when he started to write um, his first directives on the coronavirus, um, we can see it's January 24th, which is just one day after Wuhan started quarantine, right? So this is when the Chinese New Year was just beginning. People were starting to go home. People were hearing the news of this disease, but they weren't quite sure what was going on. It was almost like the United States about a month ago, right? Rudy Gobert started to get sick. The NBA started to shut down. People are scared. People don't know what to do. It was this time, again, late January pretty long time ago, right? Um, that Dr. Tutinpunzok starts to translate um, government directives from, from the, the public health uh, experts in China 
and and put them in understandable colloquial Tibetan posts. So he wrote, um, do not go out into highly populated places. If you do go out, wear a mask. When you come home, wash your hands, avoid food from uh, places that have the disease and don't go out to eat or drink or anything like that. Because as you can see at this time, things were not quite as locked down throughout China, right? Um, after the quarantine in Wuhan, slowly the rest of China also effectively shut down, schools moved online and so forth. But again, it was the new year, so things were not quite there yet at this point. Um, this should all be familiar by now, right? In fact, this last or the second point about wearing a mask might be a relatively new uh, piece of advice for the United States, but all the rest of this has been true in the United States for a month now. Um, and seeing this advice go out in January, uh, again, should give us pause, right? We knew what was happening in China, um, and yet we as a nation in the United States kind of ignored or, or felt like that was China's problem, maybe the better way of putting it. This is China's problem, it's not our problem, and it'll probably just go away, was kind of the, the message all the way into, into March. Um, so Tutan Punsog is giving this advice, and um, we are going to continue with looking at similar such advice um, just across different sources. So what, what is he doing? He's addressing the public. He's telling them what is happening. He's giving them uh, a sense of what they can do to avoid the disease and make sure that they don't contract it. Tutin Puntog is speaking from what we might call a biomedical perspective uh, or maybe even a public health perspective. Um, but that's not the only perspective. And so we're going to think about some other perspectives that will help us shed light on the situation and really the emotions um, that we're all struggling with right now, which is kind of the point of this talk. To put it in the words of Arthur Kleinman, we, when we uh, become sick or when the people around us become sick, we are left with two questions, which is why me or us or them? Um, in this case, we, can, we really can think about this in many different ways. Um, and what can be done. And if you probe your own consciousness right now, you might be able to find not just one, but a few answers to this question. Why did that person get sick? Well, maybe it's because they didn't wash their hands or maybe because somebody breathed on them. There are conversations about race and class that are happening all over Twitter right now. Um, and so this question of why me and what can be done, it, it's key and it's on everybody's mind right now. I'm going to speak about four different ways of thinking about answers to these questions, expulsion, exorcism, exploitation, and then finally moral clarity. And as you can see, three of them are, are ones that might feel a little distant, but I, I plan to bring them a bit closer to us. Um, before we get into it, where is Tibet? This is an important question. Here is kind of an outdated satellite image of Asia. I just happened to have on my hard drive, so I used it. Thank you, Google. Um, in the middle of your screen, you can see uh, the Tibetan Plateau. And one reason I'm showing you this image is because it's enormous. Uh, at the bottom edge are the Himalayan mountains, right? The tallest mountains in the world. South of that is the uh, Indian subcontinent. North is the Tibetan Plateau. Um, north of the plateau is the Taklamakan Desert. Maybe you can see that desert looking uh, space kind of to the northwest of the map you're seeing here. To the northeast is the Gobi Desert. Um, and then, of course, uh, east of that is the, um, the kind of central plain of China, I think is what it's usually called. So here are some labels for you, right? And they have the, the various uh, political boundaries. Tibet is a, a, the Tibetan Plateau has many political boundaries across and throughout it. And so that makes this question of where is Tibet actually rather complicated. Um, and most of the conversations we are having concern the central part of Tibet. But as you can see, the Tibetan Plateau extends into Yunnan, Sichuan, Gansu, Qinghai. Uh, it's not limited to the Tibetan Autonomous reg Region of today. And even into Northern India, Bhutan, Nepal, uh, the Tibetan Plateau, again, is massive um, and, and unites uh, the, the central parts of, of Asia. Um, okay, so expulsion. Our first story begins with uh, an interesting text called The History of Religion in Khotan. Maybe you've never heard of Khotan before. It's right where the Tibetan Plateau hits the Taklamakan Desert. So if, if you look at that Xinjiang labeled desert, it's where Tibet encounters this desert. 
Um, and so the history of religion in Khotan, uh, it's a Tibetan language text that is about Khotan and the Tibetan um, encounter with Khotan. So Khotan was an important kingdom in the late 10th century uh, and, and before that, of course, but uh, leading up to the 10th century when eventually Turkic armies, the Karkhanid armies came in and effect effectively ended the kingdom of Khotan. So it, it's a bit of a, um, an ancient kingdom, although the place of Khotan still exists. It's called Khotan in, in Chinese. Um, so this history of religion in Khotan, it tells a story. We're not going to think about the entire text, but there's one element in it. There's a Chinese princess who comes to Tibet, marries a Tibetan emperor, um, which all happened in the eighth century. Uh, the text is probably written a couple hundred years later, but still by Tibetan standards, extremely early and provides a relatively um, close account and a relatively descriptive account of this event. It's not to say that we should just take it at face value, but at the same time, we do know a Chinese princess came from Chinese sources. And so there is some historical weight to this document that many other documents speaking about this period maybe do not have. Um, and the, what happens in this story is there's a fear. There's a reason for that fear. So here is an image of the text. Uh, it's PT 960. Uh, it, it means it was found by Paul Pellio and is kept in the National Library in Paris. Um, and so I won't read this entire quotation for you. In fact, you can find an analysis of this in Matthew Kapstein's book, uh, The Tibetan Assimilation of Buddhism. Uh, and so I encourage you to, to check that out if you, if you want to know more about the story. Um, but the part we wanted to focus on is that there was a host of demons who became agitated at the presence of foreign monks in Tibet. These monks came from Khotan, uh, and, and uh, they were encouraged by the Chinese princess. Uh, Buddhism flourished. Everybody was happy. It's almost like you can imagine, it, a, a, just a smiling kingdom of happy folks. But then this black pox comes and other sorts of disease. Um, the princess dies from the black pox. People lose their faith, they get scared, they get worried. And again, uh, maybe if we read this text last year, which is actually when I, I first started to do some of this research, was, was uh, well before this year, um, we could perhaps imagine the fear, but now we can really feel it, right? The same fear is the same fear that grips us today. I live in New York. Every time I walk out of my house, I, I just look at the world as if it is filled with demons and poxes and so forth. Um, and so the, the clergy, the monks, are cast out. They're sent to northern India. Um, and uh, that's kind of the end of the story, at least the part that we, we are concerned with. So the, um, this first story is a story of expulsion, right? Uh, foreign monks come. They anger the demons. Everybody gets sick, especially the princess. She dies. And uh, the foreign monks are kicked out to try to placate the demons. Um, now, if we fast forward a little bit, a slightly later uh, account, 11th century, although there's a um, potentially 9th or 10th century version of this same story, fragments of which were found at Dunhuang. Um, in any case, and let's just call it an early account, uh, later than the history of religion in Khotan, though. We have Shantarakshita, who's an Indian monk, famous Indian monk, who came to Tibet in um, the fragments found at Dunhuang, we see, and so this would be a, a, at the very latest, a 10th century work, um, we see fears of foreign spirits and evil spells in, in reference to this monk, Shantarakshita. So there's a sense that a foreigner comes and Tibetans are afraid. And when people first started analyzing this text, maybe it wasn't so clear what they were afraid of or why they were afraid, but if we think there was some sort of contagious disease that was brought by foreign monks, we can understand why people would be afraid, right? There's a sense that maybe this monk is bringing some sort of evil spell and is going to cast that spell on the Tibetan people and lead to more disasters. And indeed, that's what we see happening in the story. Uh, again, it's, it's blamed on demons. Demons become upset by the presence of these foreigners. The imperial palace floods. There's a fire in, in a castle in, in Rasa or Lhasa, as it's now called today. And there are plagues among both people and livestock. Um, and so uh, 
even though this is, we could say, a more legendary account, slightly different, different characters, different situation, when we, when we compare it with the history of religion in Khotan, the similarity um, is, is really one and the same, right? We have foreign monks coming, uh, we have demons getting upset, and then they punish the people by causing disasters. What's different in the story, though, is Padma Sambhava. Now, you might have noticed him on the right side. He, he's really our hero of today, Padma Sambhava. Um, he is a ritual master. <clears throat> if we compare him with Shandarakshita for a moment, Shandarakshita is a more scholastic uh, monk. He, he was an abbot of a famous monastery in South Asia. Um, he was well-trained in Buddhist literature. And so he it represents one vision of what Buddhism is. It, it's, a, it's a mastery over knowledge, over texts, and so forth. Um, Padmasambhava is different. Padmasambhava is a tantric master. He's a master of ritual. Uh, there are early texts, as, as shown by Jake Dalton, uh, among other scholars working on Padmasambhava, that show in his earliest form, he is a subduer of demons. He's a master of the yoga tantras. He's a, a, a master of ritual techniques uh, for subduing nasty demons. And so um, his presentation kind of shifts over the years. He, he becomes what's called the second Buddha. There's a great uh, show and conference for Padmasambhava at the Rubin Museum in recent years, celebrating him as the second Buddha. But in these early accounts, uh, even though he's a bit more of a humble figure, um, he still has this power, this ritual power over, uh, over these demons. And so how does he do it? In, in this particular case, in the Testament of Wa, um, he asks the four great kings, the four heavenly kings, these, these Buddhist deities that, uh, that help um, Buddhist practitioners. And for example, the Sutra of Golden Light, there's an early account saying that we can appeal to them and they will come to save us. Um, so Padmasambha performs a, a divination ritual called prasana. Um, and, and through prasana, this divination, he can communicate with the four great kings because they are these deities. One of them is known to have divine sight and he can see what is happening across um, space and time. And so he's able to ask them, who were the spirits that performed, that caused all these disasters? He learns their names. He forces them to manifest. It's a little unclear about how he does it, but this trope of learning the name of a demon is a classic trope that you can find across Eurasia. Uh, he learns their names. He forces them to manifest, probably in a spirit medium of some kind. He threatens them, so there's, there is some ferocity here, but he also teaches them. He teaches them about moral cause and effect. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. You'll be reborn in a, in a, in a lower realm, and you will continue to suffer. And so he binds them to an oath of moral rectitude. This is often depicted as a, a coercive moment, but I, I like how in this earlier account, it's also a moment of education. He's showing them the effects of their actions. And so this is really the most famous story of Padmasambhava. He's subduing the demons of Tibet and allowing Buddhism to flourish there. And this is a story that continues to be celebrated throughout Tibetan history. Now, if we just take a moment to pause on this, we can see expulsion, exorcism. Um, what's the difference? Well, in one case, we are placating the demons because we're afraid. In the, in the second case, we don't have to placate the demons. We can subdue them, right? Because we have the power of tantric Buddhism, um, and therefore Buddhism, can, uh, uh, Buddhism and the foreigners who practice it can stay in Tibet. And that's really the, the takeaway message of the story. Um, if we want to think, who are the demons of 2020? That, it's actually a pretty difficult question. You might think the demons perhaps are the virus. Uh, the, the virus itself is a demon. I'd say, I'd say that is one way we could think about it. Um, and if we want to continue with that metaphor, we could think about the medicines we could use to subdue that demon and uh, solve all of these various problems that are plaguing us today. Um, Another way we could think about it is that the other people around us, as I go out in New York and I see all the people enjoying the nice weather in the parks and so forth, and you can see a lot of grumpy conversations about this on the internet, um, we could think they're the demon, it's their fault, or maybe a politician somewhere who didn't take uh, 
obvious directive seriously until it was too late and it's that person's fault or something like this. Um, there are many demons we could identify, right, among, among people and try to place blame upon them. And so uh, I think bringing our awareness to this process, right, that we have this fear and it's, it's a very short step from fear to blame to the scapegoating process as Gerard has written about and many others uh, based on plague, I must, I, I must remind us. Um, we are, are, are witnessing a similar such phenomenon here in, in Tibet over a thousand years ago. So when we think about what are the demons of 2020, um, we could blame a virus, we could blame other people, although I encourage you to go a uh, more metaphorical route and think of fear itself, right? To evoke John F. Kennedy, um, it's the fear itself which is our demon. And so that leads us into um, our next conversation. Uh, one, one thing to keep in mind too, as you can see, this is something that is happening now. This fear is leading to racist attacks that have been happening. That was one of the first things that started to happen as early as January. We can see a slightly more artistic racist attack happening on, on the screen here, uh, implicating that China itself is some kind of virus, which of course Beijing requested an apology over. I don't know if they ever got it. Um, one one place where this fear and blame comes into play, Catherine Mason has a great study uh, relatively recently, 2016, on SARS and public, he public, public health and the separation of the healthy from the sick, where the healthy might fear, blame, and even exploit the sick, which is something we will see in a moment. So this is one way of thinking about um, and a, a response to disease is, is to take this fear and apply some sort of blame. Next, we will consider exploiting that blame. So exploitation. We're back to Tutan Punsok. Um, he made this cartoon just a couple days later. Um, and I also translated this. I encourage you to check it out. Um, before he wrote the cartoon, at the end of the previous note we were discussing, he says, Traditional medicine, Tibetan medicine, Chinese medicine, religion, all of this has no efficacy. Or it has not been established. I think that's a slightly more uh, balanced way of, of, of stating his position. Um, he says one's own devotion, faith, mantra, recitation, medicinal amulets will have no effect at all. Um, so again, this is a controversial statement. Um, in fact, I was looking at a Facebook conversation recently on the uh, Asian medicine zone, uh, traditional medicine zone maybe, uh, about this very topic. Should we recite mantras if we are traditional doctors or taking traditional medicines? Should we re recite mantras along with these medicines? Um, Tutin Punzog is saying no, that actually this is not an effective treatment. Um, he, he comes out in this uh, cartoon and states it more explicitly. Now I'm translating it for you. Um, he says this black nine pill is being sold in Tibet, which did not have any cases of the diseases that at that time. Later, there was, I think, only one case in Lhasa, which and that person recovered. So th this disease was actually not a major issue in Tibetan populations. Uh, in eastern Tibet, there were more cases, um, but still throughout central Tibet and western Tibet, there were, there were virtually none. I think there are some in diaspora communities in northern India now as well. Regardless, though, this black nine pill was extremely popular, and Tutin Punso is criticizing these doctors, these unscrupulous doctors, pharmacies, hospitals, and so forth, um, for selling this pill to the Tibetan people. So what is this pill? Um, the black nine pill, Nakbo Gunjur, is an early formula. I found one uh, account in a 15th century text from the Dranti family. Um, doesn't mean they invented it, but it, at, at the very latest, we have a 15th century account. Uh, it contains musk. That's a key substance in, in this pill. And musk, of course, comes from a musk deer. It's a relatively rare ingredient. It's, it's highly aromatic. Uh, many perfumes were created using musk. There's something that people describe as the musk road, uh, much like the Silk Road, which connects Tibet to the rest of Eurasia, particularly going west. And so the perfumes of uh, the Middle East and on into France and the rest of Europe would often be made with Tibetan musk. Uh, now musk deers are uh, endangered. And so they're, the musk that comes from their glands, right? You have to kill the musk deer to get musk. 
um, is highly rare and expensive. Um, so anyways, this, this early formula includes musks. Uh, it was designed to be worn around the neck. And you've probably seen these uh, plague doctor masks that look like birds. Um, um, and maybe, I think this is fairly well established, but it, these masks would be filled with similar substance, maybe not musk itself, but some kind of aromatic substance. And the goal was to clean the air, right? Purify the air. There's a sense that it was the air caused um, this illness. And actually the Nakbo Gunjor, this black nine pill is operating under a pretty similar logic. There's a sense you wear it around your neck, you can smell it and it will, it'll keep you healthy. Um, Here's a, a quote from a Tibetan doctor discussing SARS. So this was research done in Lhasa um, early, uh, in the early 21st century. Uh, Craig and Adams uh, wrote about this in 2008. So one doctor was saying incense was being used widely. Um, there's a sense that incense could clean the air and help prevent the spread of disease. And then they talk about this Nagbo Gunjur. Uh, they, they actually wrote Gudchu, which could be another uh, another formula, but my guess is they just mistook Jur for Chu. Um, and then they talk about other amulets and explicitly say that business was good, right? So these, these hospitals were making money based on these products. And if we rewind to Tutin Punsok's uh, uh, cartoon here, um, we can see what he is beginning to criticize, right? He's saying that these pills have no efficacy. They are based on an understanding of disease that are that is largely at odds with what he would call um, Western medicine. He, he advises people to go to a Western hospital instead, and he says that people are just wasting their money on these pills. Okay, um, now I want to provide one more analysis as we move away from this idea of exploitation and try to enter into what I'm calling moral clarity or a way to cultivate care. I want to turn to a text called The Vase of Deathless Ambrosia, uh, the Chime Dutsi Bumba. It's sometimes called the Dutsi Bum Chen, which is part of this larger cycle. It's actually a pretty massive text. Um, it's called a treasure text, which means it was theoretically buried by Padmasambhava or one of his students. And then later communities uh, can reveal this text and reveal these teachings that perhaps earlier generations were not ready for. So this is one such text. And if we think about the role of mantras and amulets, I have a, 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 a reference to the Dalai Lama um, advising us to recite the Tara mantra, who is this uh, bodhisattva of compassion. So he's saying we need to appeal to compassion in this time of fear and blame, which, uh, as, as I said, that's something I actually uh, agree with, and that's kind of the thrust of this talk. Um, in this text, we also find similar such mantras, although they are not directed toward Tara. They're, they're sort of part of a, a separate cycle. And so many doctors, Tibetan doctors I've heard interviews with, are referring to this text. This is um, a famous text on contagious disease. And so it's, it's, uh, its history is not totally clear. I, I'm guessing it's from the 13th century. There's been some research done on it. Uh, a colleague of mine, Carmen Simioli, has done some important work on it, but um, so much still needs to be done. As you can see, I'm arguing that there are buboes being descri described in this text. That's not a major part of my argument for today. Um, but what I, one thing I want to show is that there is re, what we might call empirical medicine happening in this work. Um, so I, I, for listeners who don't know Tibetan medicine very well, you might be con, uh, kind of uh, assuming that this is some sort of tradition of mantras and amulets, and that, that's the impression you get from Tutin Punsok. Uh, that's you, the impression you get from the account so far. But in this text, we, we do see what Janet Gyatso has called the medical me mentality, reaching toward empirical accountability. That too can be found. There are observations of bodies, observations of fevers, the notion that we get a fever when we get this contagious disease. You have to look at a body, feel a body, touch a body, um, examine a body in order to understand these things. So looking at patients as physical bodies and determining their physical illnesses. That is present here. 
<clears throat> Although I think to emphasize this and ignore all the rest would also be a disservice to the tradition as well. Um, what sorts of medical therapies are here? We have lancing, which is cutting open the buboes, cauterizing them as well, so burning them so they close. Um, there's Materia Medica, so using various herbs and minerals, black aconite, bitumen, pomegranate, cardamom, cinnamon, just to name a few. So what we might call surgery, what we might call medicine, that's most certainly present in this tradition, uh, in this text even. Uh, but at the same time, there's also an emphasis on ethics as well, which might be familiar from experts of um, European encounters with the Black Death. We have Padmasambhava discussing the coming of an age of degeneration uh, with his partner, Joma Karchempa, which um, my classmate, Liang Jue, uh, she just defended her dissertation about this very relationship. So congratulations to her. Um, so th they're discussing this trunk of ignorance with leaves of negative emotions and harvests of sins and fruits of diseases ripening. So this is clearly an agricultural metaphor for connecting um, negative emotions to negative actions and finally to diseases, right? It's a way of explaining disease. We go back to Kleinman's questions about why is this happening to us and what can we do about it? Well, it's happening to us because we're bad boys and girls, right? And this is, a, again, a classic move for contagious disease throughout the world. Um, but Padmasambhava doesn't stop there. He says this will be a generation, an age of degeneration. He's speaking about the future. It's a little bit of a complicated frame story, but the bottom line is he, this is theoretically a conversation happening in the eighth century. He's talking about a future time when this text is revealed, which I think is, again, the 13th. Um, Turkish armies, is, he uses a very interesting word here to talk about Turkish armies. He doesn't use the more common drugu or khor or something like that. He calls them turuk, uh, which almost certainly is the Karkhanid armies coming to Tibet, which um, was a historical phenomenon in the, around the, the turn of the 13th century. So he's saying we, we will enter into this age of degeneration and because of our sinful actions, and he elaborates on those, there'll be this horrible disease that happens. So that's another way of thinking about the disease in addition to demons, right? In addition to the medical mentality, we have this ethical vision as well. Um, and so finally, what should we do, right? Uh, we, we've been explaining disease comes from demons, disease comes from ethics, disease comes from medical explanations. Um, what, what should we do about it, right? What can we do to go forward? Uh, one thing is we could be more ethical, we could subdue demons, uh, we could try to heal bodies, right? All of these lend themselves. But I, I think this cultivation of care is, is the note I would like to, to leave you on. Um, and before we can see a description of how to do that, we need a little bit of a, a, a background knowledge. So there's uh, the Buddhist concept of emptiness, which is this lack of inherent existence all around us. Um, it's saying that things perhaps don't exist as solidly as they appear to. They're impermanent, they're empty. Um, the mind of awakening is this altruistic motivation to uh, ease the suffering of other beings, to achieve enlightenment for the sake of other beings. It's called bodhicitta. Uh, that's also uh, part of this conversation. And then finally, uh, divine pride. This is a, a tantric idea. And so as we move from uh, what we might call a, an early vision of radical wisdom, emptiness, a vision of radical, radical compassion, this mind of awakening, we finally move into Tantra, which is, of course, what Padmasambhava is an expert of. And so from this state of emptiness, we can reimagine ourselves as being um, a Buddha or a protector spirit, uh, as if we are enlightened ourselves, right? We can merge our our sense of identity, our sense of self, perhaps, to use a kind of a, a debatable term there, um, and, and merge our identity with these protector deities. And so what do we do from this state? Well, then we can go out and treat people, right? So if I'm a doctor living during this time of contagious disease, uh, it would be tempting to leave the old people and the young people and the the disenfranchised and the helpless behind and just try to save myself, right? If the whole world is scared, uh, that that sounds like a pretty appealing option. Um, 
as we know, many of the physicians who are working in the hospitals now. I, I have a student who's a physician working at a hospital in New York talking about how scared she is, all the, the bodies. And, and uh, there are articles about um, burying bodies in public parks because they're not able to dispose of the bodies quickly enough. Really disturbing things are happening right now. It, it would be tempting to stay home, right, to stay away from the hospital. I, I don't know how uh, these brave doctors and nurses are willing to go work in, in these hospitals at this time of incredible emergency. Not, not to mention all of the emergency response personnel and, and everybody who is uh, just taking great risk to serve their fellow citizens. It's, it's unbelievably inspiring and every day at seven o'clock, Americans applaud them in a very American sort of way saying thank you. Um, and so here we see a similar call um, but there are tools being given to develop that sense of care, right? To cultivate that sense of care. So when we see all of these infirm people, these people who are in danger and who need our help, we need to cherish them as we would cherish our own heart, free from conceptuality with this mind of awakening that I just uh, discussed with you. We should not separate from divine pride, from this power that is given to us through this tantric uh, tantric practice, and then finally heal with fierce love and compassion. So as we turn back to the present day, um, again, Dr. Tudum Punsok wrote a poem um, about all of the exploitations and all of the difficulties that are happening uh, throughout the world, throughout Tibet. Uh, this was back in January. So again, Americans were telling people to think about the flu, and isn't the flu more dangerous, and so forth. And that, of course, has not aged very well. Um, so what I would call for um, now, and in similar such situations, and in retrospect, this is what we needed uh, throughout this entire global crisis, um, is moral clarity. Um, to appeal to Paul Farmer, he has a quote that's attributed to him floating around the internet. I don't think it's a real, I haven't found the source for that quote, but he definitely describes areas of moral clarity, which for him is uh, when you have the tools at your disposal to alleviate um, or even uh, just totally end the suffering of a person or group and you act. Um, and so we do not have the tools at our disposal to totally uh, end this uh, spread of this disease, but we can work together to flatten the curve, of course. There are fairly well-established techniques we can, um, we can participate in in order to help the suffering of all the people around us. Uh, and so if we take this idea of moral clarity and apply it to our current situation, we must cooperate in these acts of social distancing. We must work together in order to flatten the curve. And I, I think that is the, the, the the call that we must answer right now. Um, larger than this, uh, I, if you'll allow me to make some recommendations, um, we need more masks, right? It, to say that uh, just like Yudo Yudo is wearing a mask here, to say that all the different people need to make their own masks out of cloth, which is obviously not nearly a, as an effective um, material as, as a, a properly produced mask, we need to be given them, right? If, if I wait in line for an hour at CVS and I can't even buy a mask, how am I supposed to wear one? I don't even have a mask to wear right now, right? It's, it's, uh, it's kind of a little too, it, the, the advice that we should just start wearing masks is too little too late. We need, we need to work together and to see this with eyes of clarity and think how can people wear masks if they don't have them, right? We need to work together in order to get these masks and unfortunately many of us are not in a position to supply them, okay. My rant is over. Um, so finally, to kind of summarize what we've seen so far, we can use these meditation techniques um, to manage our own fear and anxiety, cultivate compassion. And then finally, this last part is key, act with care, right? It's not to say we should uh, like crazy horse do a ghost dance and then pretend like we're not gonna get hurt by the bullets. We will get hurt by the bullets, right? And so we need to act with care, but at the same time act with wisdom um, and, and work together to to limit the spread of this virus uh, in a coordinated fashion. Um, so finally, I'll leave you with, again, Dr. Tutin Punsok. Um, if you have honor, he's speaking to Tibetan physicians right now. If you have honor, dispense your medicines. If you have empathy, donate your medicines. 
but to exploit this opportunity to sell your medicine as an act of evil. Uh, thus, Tibetan physicians take advantage of this opportunity for spiritual practice, donate medicines throughout the land, and your good motivation will be praised by all. So um, as individuals, again, I, I encourage you to, um, to stay strong, to address the demons of fear that are all around us, to try to see others as not potential causes of disease, but as other people who deserve to be healthy, just like you and me, and together we can work together uh, and, and, and end this disease. All right, thank you very much. And please uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Um, I think my email address is here at the bottom. So yeah, feel free to get in touch. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and take care. Be well, everybody.